the Spread. I'm Captain Chad Bryson, and this is going to be Series 1 in our musky fly tying videos. We're going to continually add to this series as, you know, the seasons change and we change from fly sizes. You know, in the, in the late spring after spawn, I'm probably going to be fishing something like this muskrat. But fall and winter, deep of winter, I'm probably going to be using something like this buzzkill fly. And what I'm going to show you today is like my standard primary musky fly size, which is somewhere between the two flies that I just showed you there. So like I said, we're going to continually add to this as everything progresses and we do different patterns and different places that we fish. So I hope you enjoy it. Okay guys, so I'm just going to go over some of the materials and tools that we're going to use. Like always, a lot of my flies, most of my flies are not that complicated, quite honestly. Today it's going to be a little more technical just because I'm going to go over very specifically the quality of bucktail that you need to be using or need to try and find. Uh, we'll cover that in just a second. I'm going to go with just the standard tools to begin with. This is a right bobbin. It's 30 bucks or so, but it's the best one out there. It'll change the way you tie. It's great. Um, just Dr. Slick scissors. As far as a hook, I'm using an Gamakatsu SL12S 8 aught hook. Yep, 8 aught because musky. Um, I'll be using articulated big game shanks, medium size. And then on this fly, I'm going to use the big fish mask, the number 15, with living eyes for the eyeballs. And then the other thing I've started using, which makes it really good for the fish mask and everything, is the UV clear, clear glue. Clear cure glue is gone. We don't know where the guy went. He's vanished off the face of the earth. Aliens may have gotten him. But Loon has come out with a really good product that actually I like a lot better than the clear cure goo. And then the flashlight. So as far as the materials go, for my musky flies, it's a little bit, for my, my medium and big size musky flies, I use a little bit different quality bucktail than I do for just my trophy trout flies. I still, you know, like on the, the buzzkill, this is still pretty big bucktail fibers. And, and for a lot of guys and, and gals out there, they look at it and say, well, man, that's a, that's a really big trout fly, but not really. It's, it's actually a really good musky and trout fly. But the fibers, the hair fibers I'm going to use are going to be similar to what I'd use for this big muskrat fly. And so when you go into your fly shop, you know, I can tell you all bucktail is not created equal. And you go in and you pull, this is a pack, right? I'm not going to name names here because I'm not going to be a hater. But, you know, when you go into your, to your fly shop, pull the bucktails out and look at them and look at the fibers on them and see you want them to be straight, not, not too kinky, uh, but you want them to be straight and long. So this is actually a pretty good one. This just, you know, for a regular store-bought bucktail that hasn't been, you know, genetically enhanced. But the difference between that one, which is a pretty good one that comes just straight out of the fly shop versus something like this, you can automatically see the difference. The hair fibers are incredibly long. They're really straight, no kinky fibers or anything. And so what that does for you when you're when you're tying the fly is you're, you can use less material and, and achieve the same results. So when you're going to tie a fly this big for musky, and you think about what you've got to do to cast this fly, you know, T14 lines, 11, 12 weight rods, on and on and on, because that's what it takes to throw something this big, you want to use as little material as you can because all of it soaks up and holds water. So instead of trying to throw two pounds through the air, maybe you're only throwing a pound. Uh, the other thing that I use a lot of in my musky flies is schlapping. <clears throat> Excuse me. Most of your fly shops in the south are getting into the musky end, you know, the musky fly end of, of the business. And so it's a little more available here than it's been in the past. But you're basically looking for a clump of schlappen that's this big. You know, and you can see there's a whole lot of it in there. A lot of different sizes, different lengths, widths, the whole bit. 
And so what I'll do is go through and pick out the individual feathers that I want to use depending on what I'm trying to achieve. And again, just like the, just like the bucktail, the more of this you use, the more it's going to soak up and hold water and the heavier it's going to be to cast. But we still need the profile without the weight. That's really it on the materials. It's pretty simple. We're going to get started, show you how to tie this fly. All right, so we're going to get started. Gamakatsu SL12S 8 aught hook because that's what it takes. Make, it, make your jaws adjust in there nice and tight. And just like any other fly, I'm just going to lay down a little bit of thread here at the back and I'm using gel spun thread fibers. So before I do anything else, before I even start, I want to have a plan or a program of how I'm going to make this fly come together. And you can't just, you can't just throw a bunch of materials on a hook or a shank and expect it to come out right. You kind of got to plan ahead. So this is, this is going to be like my fall winter fly, a variety of colors. My favorite color to tie them in is yellow with maybe some, some darker color or gray or something mixed in on occasion, but, but yellow really seems to work for me. Maybe it's just because I like it, I can see it in the water. But I'm gonna put, I'm not gonna use really big feathers, but I'm gonna put a few feathers here just at the back of the shank making a little bit of a tail coming off just so that it's got some wiggle. I'm not going to use the entire length of the feather. But if you can find a few that are about the same consistency, and then I'll just put them up here, just stage them up to see how they lay and how they're going to look. The way I can kind of gauge the length of what I want out of this. All right, so I can use these guys. So instead of just laying them up here in a clump, I'm going to put them up one at a time. So I've got, how many have I got here? One, two, three, four. Perfect amount. So I'm going to lay them out one at a time. I'm going to tie them on one at a time. And you can see how the feather has a little bit of cup to it, how it's cupped around. So I want, for this, I want the cup to be on the inside of the hook like so. Some people call it praying hands. Some people call it all kind of things. But I like to call it the cup because everybody knows what the cup is. So. That's about the length I want. It's not going to be a super huge fly, but it's not going to be as small as the buzzkill either. So I'm going to leave it about like so. And I'm cranking down on this with a lot of pressure. So there's one. Now I'm going to take the next one. And the cup is going to go the opposite way. The cup is always facing the hook shank. Tie it up here. I'm going to lay it up. They don't have to be exactly the same length, but close is good. Just like hand grenades, close is good enough. I don't want to wrap too far down the bend of the hook. You want everything to be running pretty straight coming off. These guys are heavy, so they're going to naturally fall off to the side there and droop. But in the water, you want everything to run straight, straight line with the shank of the hook.
that and one more. So I've got my four feathers laid in for the tail of the fly. I'm just going to finish that out a little bit. Make it look nice and clean. Cinch it in. Okay. So the next part is to start thinking about how I'm going to lay the bucktail in. And there's a couple of different ways that I'm going to lay the bucktail in. Some of it's going to be tied standard, and then some of it's going to be a reverse tie or a hollow tie or Popovich or whatever terminology you want to call it or use it. doesn't really matter to me, but some of it I'm going to lay in this way, and some of it I'm going to lay in the opposite way and then fold it back to give it some body. So at the back of the fly here, at the feathers, I'm not going to tie it reverse. I'm going to tie it straight in. And this is the part where it gets really kind of complicated that, that you know everybody says, well, man, I don't know how much material to use. Well, if you try and tie in this much, you're really not going to like how that cat swims. You still want to go with that whole less is more. And the higher quality bucktail that you have, the less material that you have to use. So... I'm going to tie in about this much for my first tie on the back of the fly here. I'm going to lay it up and gauge it and that's going to be about right, just like so. See, I kind of like spread it all the way around the hook. I'm going to spin my bobbin. And all that does is that makes the thread get a little bit better grip on the bucktail. And so I've wrapped it kind of loose here. Still kind of holding it in place. But I've wrapped it kind of loose. And so now I'm going to crank on it. I'm going to pull it down. See how it makes it flare up. So now I have this really big profile without a lot of hair fiber to hold water and make it hard to cast. So hold that back. Trim this down. And it does make a mess, and I don't care because the results are good. But I'm going to trim this one down about as far as I can. Tighten my vise back up. Now I'm just going to finish that out, make it look nice and clean. Because the next piece I put in, the next piece of material I put in is going to be in reverse tie. Because now we're getting towards the middle of the fly, so I want a little bit taller profile. So here again, I'm using the same piece of bucktail, and you notice I'm not using any flash yet. That's coming later. So I'm going to pick out a little bit. It's a little much. But my scissors are about done. Getting the guard hairs out. So now instead of laying it down standard, moving towards the back of the fly, I'm going to tie it in reverse. And you're going to see what this does. It does a couple of things. So I'm going to tie it in reverse. 
Let me get it. Moving my thread up. And I want to lay it in so that the end of the fibers are close to the front of the last bucktail that I tied in. That way, if you lay it back here on top of them, then it's just going to mash those down. But if you tie it in a little bit further up, so I got it up, and I'm just going to pinch it, spin the bobbin. There's three, four, five loose wraps. It's kind of tricky. So now I'm really going to crank it down. Help it spin around a little bit. So now what I have is all of this back here. And I'm not going to trim that off. I'm going to leave it there because when I fold this back over, it's going to help this bucktail to stand up once it gets wet. So there's a couple of different tools that you can use. Some guys use a the top of a pin, some guys use a hair stacker. My favorite custom tool, because I'm all about custom, but my favorite custom tool to use for this, this is a spool out of the inside of a piece of credit card tape, credit card receipt tape. I got this at the shop. And if you wind up with a few loose strays there, it's no big deal. Hmm, that didn't look good. So all I'm going to do now is push this back over, like so. Pull my thread around, build it up right in front of it. And you're going to have, no matter what you do, no matter how careful you are, you're always going to have some of these that pull out. And that's okay. It's not the end of the world. So now I'm just wrapping it back. And so you see now this huge profile. You got this huge profile on this fly. Massive, but there's not much there. In the water, this is going to lay down a little bit, but you see how this goes. I'm pushing it down, but because of the way I hollow tied it or reverse tied it with the, with the tag end still attached, it kind of helps everything to stand up and keep some shape. So there's one. Wrap it out here to the end almost. So now I'm going to do it one more time. It's about to ride them out. Measure it out some. So I've got it in there. Now I've got it laid back on top of my other one just a little, and that's okay. Because when I crank it down, now it's going to really stand up. you have to, you can kind of help it around, help it spin around just a little bit.
So I've used three pieces of bucktail and I've made a fly. I've made the rear section of a, of a musky fly that's really big. I mean, if you look at my hands, they're, my hands aren't huge, but they're a little bigger than normal. But even still, you know, this, the hair fibers on this fly are almost as big as my hand. And that's what you want. Build it up here just a little. Like so. I'm going to pick out some more feathers. Not too many, but just a few to go on the front. I've experimented with this over and over, trying to determine if I needed to put it at the rear of the next shank or at the front of the hook, whichever. And it seems to me that the feathers work the best and perform the best if I tie them on at the front. That way they're draped back over the, all the hair that I just put in there. So we'll find a couple here. And now you don't have to, you know, this is, this is one of those things. This is fly tying. There's nothing proprietary here. I would love to be able to say, oh, this is revolutionary. I came up with all of this on my own. I didn't learn from anybody else. It's simply not true. It's not true for anybody in the business. Everybody learns from someone else. And then you take it and you put your own little twist on it. And that's all good. But, you know, if you want to make long feathers that come all the way back to the tail, that's fine. Um, personally, on these flies, I don't really like to. I like it to be about as long as the bucktail fiber there. So I'm just going to lay one in on the side. One thing about using these these materials and tying musky flies, you're going to go through a lot of thread. So the one spool of thread that you've been using to tie 47 trout flies for the last 10 years probably isn't going to last very long. And the big advantage with the gel spun is that, you know, this is an 8 aught hook. And if I wanted, this gel spun thread is strong enough that I can pull hard enough that it'll bend that 8 aught gamagatsu hook. I don't want to do that, but that's how strong it is. And that's the amount of pressure that you really got to put on these flies and put on this material in order to get it to work. Because if you don't, all of your bucktail and your feathers are just going to pull out. These are toothy, mean, aggravated fish that just want to kill something and eat it. So it's not like this nice gentlemanly scholarly trout that has an IQ of about an eight on the human scale. You know, these fish are mean and they're hungry. So you've got to build tough flies. So here's a good feather for the other side. I'm just kind of laying that in right on the other side. Hold all my hair fibers back. Filming pretty tight here today. I just bumped my head on the camera, but we're just trying to give you a really good close-up view of how I'm doing this. So now, you see I've got these feathers they're just coming out the side. This one's kind of got a mind of its own. And that's okay because when it gets in the water, it's going to be out to the side. And so the whole idea of this and the reason to tie this way is so that when you're when you cast your fly, cast your fly, it gets in the water, you strip it and pull it, everything kind of lays down. And then as you stop to strip more, it flexes back up and it, op and it opens back up. So the fact that this crazy feather has a mind of its own is not really a deal breaker for me. I'm gonna try and see if I can fix it just because of my OCD. And that's how it's gonna be. So if you want to clean up this kind of stuff off the front of it, you can, it doesn't matter. I'm going to just because it looks good, 
doesn't really matter in regards to catching fish, but what I'm about to do next will. So I'm going to whip finish it. down there nice. I'm gonna trim it and now I'm gonna glue the hell out of it. So this is the UV glue. I'm just gonna pull everything back here a little bit. I'm not gonna go sparingly on the glue either. I'm giving it a little bit of time to soak in and I'm gonna use the UV light Basically all that's doing is cooking it. So if you're if your tine flies outside in the sunlight and you put that glue on there, glue's already dry, and you put that glue on there and the sunlight hits it, it's gonna dry immediately. So it's important to do it indoors. Then that way when you're done, you just hit it with the UV light. And she's all set. All right, so we finished our hook. We finished the rear section of the fly. Now we're gonna start attaching the big game shanks. Um, this part of it goes kind of quick, but there's a couple of little tricks that I do here um, when I'm attaching the shanks that might help you make it a little bit easier, especially dealing with your vise. So this is the 40 millimeter shank, uh, articulated big game shank that I'm gonna use. So I'm just gonna put one of those in. It's open on both ends, that way they can always attach. This is kind of the tough part, getting it over them, getting it through the eye of that hook. So now we've got it attached in there. So I'm gonna open up the jaws of my vise. Everything's free. I'm gonna tighten this just a little. tricky part is getting the jaws of your vise adjusted to a point that it's really going to hold it in there. And, you're, I'm, and I'm still going to wind up having to hold it out here just a little because of the amount of pressure I'm going to put on it. So you can see some of the aggravation here and why it takes so long to tie one of these flies. Spinning of the bucktail isn't as hard as everyone thinks. It's all the prep work and the setup. There we go. That'll do it. So now it's going to hold it back there. That's going to be fine. So I got all these open ends with in the shank here. I've got these two open ends that I don't want. Don't want that a bit. So I want those closed up because your bucktail will get wrapped up in those open ends and it doesn't work out. So you can see the shank's already moving a little bit. I'm just going to hold it. too much. There we go. About broke my finger, but I think I might have it now. All right. So everything's all set. So now I'm going to start just like I was doing before. I'm just going to put a little bit of bucktail on there. And so on the hook, I did three pieces of material. 
on the shanks, I'm really only going to do two because I'm going to reverse tie everything. So I'm only going to do two pieces of bucktail on each shank. And so the next shank will be out here. And it's basically this one is a hook and two shanks is what this fly is going to wind up being. So I've got three pieces of bucktail back here, two, and then another two. So it's going to go pretty quick. Now, if you wanted to add flash, you know, at this point you could, um, I don't really, I mean, I don't know how much difference it really makes on muskie. Uh, you know, a lot of the guys up north talk about, you know, needing to have a lot of flash and on and on. And I'm certainly not going to discredit that and say that it doesn't work. But here in the south, southern muskie, I don't think it matters as much. If you want to put it on there, put it on there. If you don't want to put it on there, I'm certainly not going to yell at anybody over it. So I'm going to pick a little bit. Looks about right. So I'm going to reverse tie this again. And on this one, I'm not going to get it as tight. I'm still going to, I'm still going to lay it up here close to the end like that. But I'm going to leave a lot more material when I go back to make it hollow. That way it'll fold over. This is the middle of the fly. So if this were imitating a fish, this would be part of, you know, the biggest part of the body of the fish. Just going to kind of help it all the way around there. And this is kind of tricky. So I've got it, I've got it wrapped around. I've got it held in there. And if I really crank on this, like I did on the hook, the shank's going to come free. It's going to pull right out. My bucktail's going to go everywhere. And I'm probably going to say a whole lot of words that moms don't want their kids to hear. So if you hold on to the shank as you crank it down, it'll stay in place. And so you see what I've created here with all these fibers in the back. Now when I push this back over, it's really going to hold up and be hollow on the inside. I'm a credit card machine tape, spool. Sometimes if your bucktail doesn't come all the way exactly perfect, you can you can babysit it some. Make it spin around the way you want it to. So that's about right. So I'm just holding the bucktail back and I'm building up a little bit in front of it. Yep, see what just happened there. Everybody almost got to hear me say the words. So there's that. Now we're going to go again. You can see this was an unused bucktail when I started and I've already used this much out of it. So this is why the flies cost so much. You're using a whole lot of material, even though it's just pretty sparse and it's gonna fish really good and cast really well. It's still pretty sparse as far as material usage goes. Go to this side. All the guard hairs out of there. I'm 
just going to work that around. Holding the shank, cranking down on it. It's like this fine line of how much pressure you put on the bucktail. You can see how much that hook shanks for the, the big game shanks moving around on me. All right, so you can see the whole thing kind of coming together. I got a lot of height here. And again, you know, it's, it's roughly about the size of my hand opened all the way up. And that's what I like. Some people don't like them that big. Doesn't matter, but this is when, you know, when it goes in the water, after it gets wet, you know, this is my, this is my muskrat fly. And after the, when the muskrat was first tied, it was big and tall like this too. But after you fish them a little bit, they kind of lay down some and that's what it winds up looking like. This is going to lay down a little bit, but I still have all of this hollow tie in here coming over the top to hold it a little bit of form. So now I'm going to pick a couple of feathers and on this one, just because I feel like it, I'm going to make these a little bit bigger and a little bit longer. There's one that I like. That's good. Find another one about that size. Sometimes that's the fun of digging through a banded clump of schlappen. It's like hunting a needle in a haystack to find one that matches perfectly. That one works. So I'm going to lay this in. Got a whole lot going on here. These guys, this guy's getting kind of busy. It's all right. It's what musky like. They like busy. Okay, so that's laid in. I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Make it look like somebody that knew what they were doing actually tied this fly. And there it is, folks. All the bad words that just got edited out. So this is going to happen from time to time. There's a couple of attachments out there um, that I'm told seem to work. I got them ordered to give it a try to prevent this whole catastrophe from happening. 
going to be honest with you, I'm quite proud of myself because I didn't have any major curse words. Alright, that's going to be good enough for now. Just enough that I can glue the thing. A lot of you guys have come to me and ask, oh, you know, Chad, will you tie me some musky flies? I'm like, yeah, sure. They're expensive. Now you're seeing why, because it's a level of aggravation, frustration, and material usage that you really just need to be in the right frame of mind for. So I've put my UV glue on there. Now I'm going to cook it. All right, we're going to let that sit for a second. I'm going to readjust a couple of things, and then we're going to move on to the last step. All right, so we're going to go to step three, and I'm going to really try and contain myself and not say any bad words here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead. You know, I had a little catastrophe there, and the shank came out. And so I'm going to hook this on. Going for the third step. Perfect. All right. So we'll try and get this right again. So you see the issue with the jaws of the vise, and it's and I'm not hating on Dyna King or any other vise manufacturer out there, because there's a lot of what we do with tying musky flies and using these shanks that's kind of new, you know, and it takes the guys some time to catch up and create stuff that works. And I'm sure that by the time we shoot our next video, there's going to be an attachment that I'm going to have, you know, to make everything go a little bit smoother. But you know what? At the end of the day, these are the struggles of research and development, trying to make some flies that work and catch fish that are kind of new. So I got it in there. I think it's going to be okay for now. I'm sure I'll be able to babysit it along, but so we're going to wrap this guy up a little bit. Close off all the ends of the shank. Please stay in there and don't make me say bad words. So one thing you can do that I like to do back here, just to keep everything straight, is I'll put my hook right in the spring and that way it holds everything up nice out of the way. And I can turn everything around if I need to, which I will need to be able to do that when I put my fish mask on. So, move my thread out just a little. All right, so this is the head of the fly. So if there was ever a time that I was going to use a little bit more material than normal, it's going to be on the head. So, I'm going to go ahead, move my thread out. I'll pick a nice big long piece. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. It's too bad we don't grow deer like this in Georgia. Most of my bucktail that I get for my musky flies comes out of the north. Michigan, Wisconsin, 
Minnesota, just because genetically their coats grow a little bit thicker, longer, more dense. The winters are colder there than they are here. But I must say that it's really nice to be able to fish muskie all winter here in the south, as opposed to snowshoeing around in the north. So you got it, got it laid in, spin it. I'm gonna hold it, hold the shank, apply pressure, and I got this nice big hollow body back here. All right, and there again, big bucktail about the size of my hand. So, as you can see, I got solid yellow and, and grizzly yellow feathers all the way back. And at this point, I gotta start thinking about how the fish mask is gonna go on. I like the big ones because that's really the profile of the fish head that I want is about that size. So not only now am I thinking about the profile of the fly, I'm thinking about how much material I need in here to hold the fish head upright. So this is a this is a, a, a point in the fly where it really just becomes your own and whatever it is that you want to do. Personally, on a lot of my flies, I like for the head to be a little bit darker color because if you look at the, the head of just about any fish, the head's always got a little bit darker color in it in contrasting with the rest of the fish's body. So at this point, I'm probably gonna switch over to an olive so that I got just a little bit of contrast color to go in there. And you know, you remember what I was talking about earlier with all bucktail is not created equal. Look at these guys. So this would be a southern deer and this would be a northern deer. And look at look at the difference in the hair fibers. I mean, I've used a little bit off of this bucktail, but not much. But you can see the difference in them there. And so it makes a big difference when you're selecting material and how you want this to go. I'm gonna see. You know what, guys, I'm going to take a break for a second, and I'm going to see if I can find a better olive bucktail that I can use for the head. All right, so I was looking for some more olive, but I didn't really have any olive that was long enough and suitable enough. But I did find this claret, and you can see, I mean, this is just straight store-bought, right from Wapsi and the Fishhawk here in Atlanta. So I'm going to try and use this claret to make the head which is an interesting contrasting color, and I think that's gonna work, it's gonna satisfy me. And at the end of the day, the fish really don't care. They just wanna see a little bit of a contrast and see something that looks really good. So I think the purple and yellow is gonna be nice. All right, so I'm gonna try and find something out of here that I can use. And it looks like that's one nice big clump right there. So because the fish mask is going to go on here, I'm going to make this a little bit thicker. Using a little more material. It's not quite as long as the other stuff. And that's okay because I don't want to take away from the yellow of the fly. I just want something that's going to work 
and give it a tiny little bit of contrast. So I'm gonna lay it in, spin my bobbin. Get this spun around. So, just looking at everything, looks like I'm going to lose a little bit and that's okay. Trying to hold this hook or the shank here a little bit. All right, so now what I'm going to do, I've got that tied in, hollow tied. Now I'm just going to kind of do a dry fit and see how it looks and works. So what I have, I got two choices in this fly and it just really, honestly, it depends on what kind of mood I'm in. By the time I get to this point, tying these things, if I, if I feel like I want to go one more, then I'll tie in another piece up here and then just use a razor blade and trim it back and make a Buford head. And the action is totally different. But for our purposes here today, I really just want the fish mask on there because I want that lower, more sleek profile. And I'm not really too worried about having this amount of hook sh or shank left in front of the head. I'm not too worried about that because I'm, I'm achieving what I want. And what I want is, a, is, a, is this profile, exactly like so, with a few feathers on the side. I think I am, however, going to tie in a couple of big yellow feathers up here on the side, just to give it a little bit more of a lateral line. All right, I got two of my feathers laid in. That's all I want. So now I'm just kind of, honestly, I'm just kind of stopping, taking a second, looking it over, make sure it's exactly how I want it to be. I'm thinking about, do I really want to go to the trouble of putting in a little bit more bucktail out here on the front to make a different colored head? And I don't think I want to. I think I just want to go ahead with the fish mask 
and put it up there. So again, I'm just going to kind of dry fit it just like so. And this is an opportunity where you can adjust your feathers around, make them go straight. Hooks are sharp. That just hurt. Um, but I've got her set out there like so. And honestly, that's about the profile that I really want. So the steps to put the fish mask in are not that complicated. I'm going to whip finish it. I'm just going to glue the thread here. Cook it a little bit. Okay, so that's done. I'm gonna have a look at the fish mask one more time. And it's gonna work, gonna work nicely. So to put the fish mask on, it's a, it's a little bit of a different process. I got everything all done, all set here. So I'm gonna coat the inside of the fish mask with the UV glue, then I'm going to slide it up there, and then I'm going to hit it with the light and cook it on. And that's, that's step one of putting it on in a way that's going to make it stay on there and work. So I coated everything, got it on, I want to get it centered, and cook it. All right, so I got her centered up really nice. It's glued on. Now, if you leave it just like this, you're really not gonna like the results of it. So this is the other part about using a lot of thread that I was talking about. So now I'm just gonna build a dam in front of it. Oh yeah, it's gonna be interesting too. So now I'm just going to start wrapping thread up in front of it. And the thing with the gel spun is you can't just build a whole lot in one spot. You kind of got to gradually build up to it. Go back and forth and back and forth. Okay, so now I've got just enough of this buildup that's going to hold the head from coming off. It's holding it very stationary. The glue on the inside just kind of holds it together and stays put. Now I've got pressure built up against it, pressing it back against the bucktail fiber, and it's not going to be able to come off. So I'm going to whip finish it again. twice just because I feel like it. And you can see right here, I'm already starting to run out of gel spun. 
and this was one fly. And basically, I, th I think I tied one other fly out of one spool of gel spun, out of this spool of gel spun. So when you're talking about making the stuff, making these flies, it's a lot of material, a lot of material usage. I've used like all of the good parts out of one bucktail, yellow bucktail, used almost one spool, one spool of gel spun on two flies, so they're expensive to make. So now I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'm gonna glue this off. I'm gonna coat it really, really well. Let that run all the way around. I'm gonna loosen my vise, use the rotary portion of my vise, and I'm gonna cook it. Cook it as it spins. So now I'm going to go back and find the dry spots, recode it. Basically on this thread dam at the head, I want the whole thing to be coated in glue. Cook it again. Okay, put that away. Now it's time to put eyeballs on the fly. One of the reasons I like the fish mask so much is because it's really easy to put eyeballs on there and make them really durable. You know, bait fish and, and prey fish have eyeballs. They're fish, fish have eyes. So this is like one of the most important parts to me anyway, is that the fact that you have to have eyeballs on your fish. So I found some really cool eyeballs left over uh, that I've forgotten that I had. So I'm gonna use these just because they look good. And I'm really not gonna do too much dynamic on the front end of it. I'm gonna put just a little bit of glue down, not much. This glue will dry without having the light shone, shined on it. However, the cool part I think is what I do next. So I got that in there and I got it moved around how I want it. Now what I do is I coat the whole inside. And then I cook it. And basically what this does is this creates a hard shell over top of your eyeballs. How many times you went through all the trouble, you know, you made a fly that looked really nice, you glued some eyes on the outside of it, went and fished it, you bounced it off one rock or one tree or maybe one fish bit, and then you get your fly back to the boat and one of the damn eyeballs is gone. And so there you are. You're in the middle of the river, you're in the middle of nowhere, and your very best fly is missing an eyeball meaning that it doesn't look right. But I found that if I do this and I coat it over, and this is an, again, one of the reasons I like the fish mask is because I can coat over top of the eyeballs and this bad boy is on there forever. Same thing on the other side. Just a little drop. Drop the eyeball in. It. 
So what this does, you know, in addition to holding your eyeballs in there, is it, it literally makes the head nice and round and smooth. I don't have any scientific proof that it gives it any better action. I think, honestly, it just makes me feel better about what I'm doing. But it really does seem to make a difference. And I know that once I started doing this, and I mean, basically you're welding the eyeballs into the fish mask. Once I started doing that, I didn't lose any more eyes off of my flies. So. Going around it one more time. Make sure she's all good and all set. So that's it. So literally I can take this fly right now. And if I had musky in my backyard, I could go and try and catch one with it. But that's it. Hey, thanks for joining me. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, it's a really good fly. It's going to be a great fall winter size and profile and color scheme uh, after we got through a few of the problems there. But I hope you enjoyed everything. Thanks for joining us. I'm Captain Chad Bryson. If you got any questions, please contact me at In the Spread. I'd be happy to share every secret that I know with you. Thanks.